So good morning everybody and welcome to what is it day 63 of lockdown or something like that 62 um, not quite keeping track of all of it I hope you guys are all well miss you guys and uh, it'd be nice to get back into a church again where we could uh, um, meet and chat and yeah, just be part of a congregation and see different faces and that sort of thing. Anyway, I hope you're well. And uh, yeah, so let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your glorious salvation. We thank you, Lord, for opportunities to learn. We thank you, Lord, for opportunities to grow in you, to get to know you and your word, Father, and your promises. And uh, going through the book of Ephesians. We see those promises, Lord, um, the giving of the Holy Spirit and um, salvation and joy and predestiny for pre, you know, being called to know you and, Father, that you've called us and that you love us all and that you are a good Father. And uh, we learn all of these things going through the book of Ephesians, Father, and we just pray that uh, today your word falls on the prepared hearts of those that are listening, Father, that those who need to learn and need to hear from you will hear from you, Father. Be with me, lead me and guide me as I teach through this piece of the Bible, Father. And use me as a vessel and my voice as your voice, Father. Lead me and guide me in all that I say and do, Father, so that we can convey your word properly, that we can convey your word without embellishment, without uh, altering it, Father, as you intended it to be. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that your word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We thank you, Lord, that your promises are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that when we receive you, we are uh, inheritors of that promise, uh, of all those promises, of all those spiritual gifts that you've given us, Lord. And that uh, we, who are some of us alone, Father, that we can be adopted as your sons and daughters. And that you will give us the love that only you can give. Lord, we thank you for all of this. And we pray that you will be with us through the coming weeks. And help and lead our uh, guide, uh, help and guide our leadership. And, and, and uh, yeah, just prepare their hearts and uh, be with him, Father, as we go through this time. And, uh, Father, we will just pray that you be with those that are sick from either COVID, from cancer, uh, from all those diseases, Father. And we just pray that uh, you will be with their families, comfort them. Um, and mostly we just pray that people come to know you through this difficult time, Lord. We thank you for all your blessings. In Jesus' glorious name, amen. So, yeah, let's uh, do some worship and uh, we'll get back to you after that.
Cool, so today we carry on in Ephesians 1 and we teaching on verses uh, 13 to, what's it, 23? Yes, 13 to 23. And just to recap, I mean, we're talking last week about the fact that God had called us from before the foundations of the earth. And we're talking about things like predestination and, you know, all those big words. And all this, all this is really saying is that God has called every single one of his children. And whether you believe in him or not, you are his child. Whether you want to believe him or not, he he is your father. He is your creator because it says that God created each one of us. He knit us together in our mother's wombs and he has a plan for every one of us. You know, so it's not like we're um, we're just a mistake. You didn't just happen. You didn't just happen because your parents got together one day and you're here. You are here because you are a plan and you are God's plan. And the question is, and this is what we're dealing with here, is are you going to take God's calling for your life? Are you going to become one of God's children? Are you going to follow what it is that God has planned for you? Okay. Now, it's interesting here in verse 13, we carry on and it says, In him you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. So quite simply put, this is what happened when Paul spoke in, the, in, in Ephesus to the Ephesians. They heard the word of God and they believed. And when they believed, they received the promised Holy Spirit. And that promised Holy Spirit comes and abides in your heart and leads and guides you. Okay. And we carry on in verse 14 and it says the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance. Now, remember, it talks about earlier, it spoke about the inheritance that we receive, the spiritual blessings that we have already received. It's not like they're still to come. We've received them already. And part of being a Christian and part of believing is that as we grow and as we grow into what it is that God has promised us, we we develop as people, you know. And you'll see a term come up just now, which I'll emphasize again. It's faith and love, faith and love. And throughout this book, we talk about faith and love, faith and love. And these are the two cornerstones of the Christian faith. Faith, believing that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, and love, love for our neighbor. Remember, um, uh, I want you to love your neighbor as you love yourself. The two commands that Jesus gave us, he said, I'm not taking away from the law that I've been given or that has been given, but I'm adding to it. These two things I give you, that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind and soul, and that you love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. And that is a, that's a loaded question and we can get into that sometime, but not today. Okay. So verse 14, the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. Okay, the down payment, the Holy Spirit is the down payment. Jesus promised, remember when we were talking through John, Jesus promised the disciples that they would receive the counselor, the friend, the Holy Spirit. He said, I must go so that he can come. If I do not go, he cannot come. Okay, and that he, remember, we're talking about the triune Godhead here. We're talking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The three are one, okay? And the Holy Spirit, now when Jesus ascended to heaven, it allowed the Holy Spirit to come and abide in our hearts and in our lives and to lead us and guide us. He is our comforter, our friend, our teacher. We need to learn to tune out the world and listen to the Holy Spirit, that small, still voice, you know what I mean? That still, small voice of God cannot speak to you when you're watching TV all the time, cannot speak to you when you're listening to music all the time, cannot speak to you when you're talking all the time. So we need to find times when we can be quiet and be still with God so that he can speak to us, okay? So 
the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance. So that is the beginning of our faith. We believe, we receive the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us and teaches us. It's the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession. You are the possession. You are God's possession. When you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you become, you're adopted, as it said earlier in Ephesians, you're adopted as his child, as his son, as his daughter. Okay, so you become God's possession. And the amazing thing is, and I've said this before, greater is he who's in us than he is in the world. You know, we get a lot of Christians that run around blaming Satan for everything, when actually it's just their sin. It's just their sin that they are not letting go of. They lust for things of the flesh. They desire for money. Remember, it's the love of money that is the root of all evil. It's not the money itself, but it's if you love money more than you love God. And that we get back to. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and everything that was there is within you. And then love your neighbor as yourself. So always in, in life, we need to put God first. So God above the church. God above our family. God about, above my wife. It sounds weird, but that's what it needs to be. Okay. So you are God's possession. Okay. So it says... The down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession, me, okay, my redemption, to the praise of his glory. So everything is because of what Jesus did for me, okay? Everything in my life should reflect and should be what Jesus did for me, to his glory, not to my glory. I don't do things because I'm wonderful. I do things because God has given me the ability to do these things. I love teaching because God has planted that desire in my heart, not because I like hearing my own voice. Okay. Oh, I need to think about that. one. All right. So that is about the Holy Spirit. Cool. Now we carry on in verse uh, 15 and it says, this is why, since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. Remember, I said earlier that faith and love, faith and love, having faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for us and loving your neighbor, okay, and treating him as you would want to be treated yourself. These are the signs of a good Christian. In the Bible, it says, and you will know them by their fruit. Now, when a Christian is vengeful and hurtful and hateful and claims to be a Christian, they're not really. They just think they are, okay? That you will know them by their fruit. So, and the fruit of the Spirit, well, there are many. There's patience, there's love, there's kindness, there's joy, there's long-suffering, there's, okay? Those are the fruit of the Spirit. And if you don't display those fruit then are you really saved? This is a big question. A lot of people go, um, are you really saved for always? No, I don't think so. The question is, and we can get into that later, uh, again, this is a different teaching, but really being saved, you would not want to offend God and hurt God and hurt other people. The fruit, the first, one of the biggest fruit of the Spirit is love for your brothers and sisters. Even if they hurt you, love them. That is one of the things. So the two things they talk about here is your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. It doesn't say for a particular few. It says for all the saints. We need to love and show love. Okay. Does that mean we let them walk all over us? No. Does that mean we have an excuse to treat them badly? Definitely not. Okay, and often I talk and uh, about the fact when you're at school and your friends are teasing you and taunting you and you retaliate with hatred, you're not displaying that love. You're not showing the fruit of the Spirit, you know, and you need to draw back and go like, hmm, am I doing the right thing here? No, not really. Okay. So, verse 16, I never stopped, now this is Paul saying, I never stopped giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. So, what he's saying is that when he prays, and this is something that we need to learn, when we pray, don't always be about me, okay? The world is not about me, 
It's definitely, I mean, I could die tomorrow and, you know, in a year or two's time, 90% of the people I've met in my life would probably forget about me and move on, okay? The world is not about me. It is about Christ Jesus. It, it, it's about eternity, okay? I never stop praying and giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayer. So when you're praying, make sure to pray for other people. Pray for your parents, Um you know, pray for your friends at school. You know, pray for your friends whose parents are ill at school. Lift them up. Pray for others. Pray for those that are hurting you. You know, I heard a classic saying the other day. Somebody said to me, you cannot hate somebody you're praying for. <laughs> it's, it's, and I've put that into practice, believe you me. There's been a few people that I've had to examine my heart about in life. And when you, you have such hatred towards them, but when you start praying for them and you pray that God touches their lives, suddenly you just find it a little bit harder to hate them. When you start grasping the concept that God loves them so much, even though they're sinners, they're still sinners, his desire is still for them to come to know him. Okay, so Paul says, I never stop giving thanks for you as long as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that God of our Lord, that the God of our Lord, Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So this comes in again, you know, again, God's, what does God want us to do? He wants us to know him. Okay. He wants us to get closer to him. He doesn't want to make us all millionaires. Okay. He doesn't want us all to be prosperous because let's be honest, when things are always going well, do you really have a need for God in your life? So God wants us to get to know him. And if we, like David, know him really well, God blessed David abundantly. But the first objective was to know him, God the Father. Okay. And um, then I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints? That's in verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart, okay, your heart, not these eyes, okay, because what we see, hmm, it's always different. The eyes of our heart are opened, enlightened, so that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Knowing what is God's calling? This is a question that everybody has. What is God's calling for my life? Does God want me to be a teacher? Does God want me to be a pastor? Does God want me to be a missionary? Does God want me to be whatever? The first thing is, and that's the first instruction he gave to all the saints is, go into the world and make disciples of all men. All men. So the first thing is we need to draw closer to God. This is our calling. This is what everybody needs to do. So stop worrying about it. You see, he says, focus on things, then all these things will be added unto you. Focus on God. Get to know God. Study the word. Learn about God. Draw closer to him. And all the other things will fall into place. They will come. You will come to know God. And God will bless you abundantly if you know him, follow him, and obey him. So everybody gets it wrong. It's like, you know, and it's not just us, you know, believe you me, one of the, one of the patriarchs of, of the faith, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, Jacob, when he ran away from home, he left Esau, remember, he, he ran away from Esau because he stole his birthright. And Jacob was in the desert and he had a dream. And God showed him a ladder that went up into heaven. And there were angels going up and down. Yes, there are angels, but we don't worship them. We worship God and Jesus, right? So the angels were going up and down. At the top of this ladder, God stood there and he said to Jacob, I will give you all these things. Okay. And then Jacob said, mm, okay. And he turned it around. He said, if you give me all these things, then... I will follow you. Whereas God was saying, follow me and I will give you all of these things. There's a difference. There's a huge difference. Okay. So your first thing, okay, in verse 18, I pray that the hearts of my enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What is his calling? For you to draw closer to him. For you to get to know him. 
for you to be fully trusting of him, God the Father, so that he then will bless you with all the other gifts and all the other things. Okay, so that's it. What is the wealth of his glorious inheritance? We spoke in the earlier verses about the inheritance that God has already given us. He's not still going to give it. We already have it. And the inheritance speaks about spiritual blessings in heaven, not wealth on earth. Okay, cool. I hope you're following this. Yeah. So, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the mighty working of his strength, not my strength. Okay. So often we get into situations, guys, where we want to do things of our own accord, of our own strength, of our own uh, plan. Okay. But God is saying, don't do that. I have a plan for you. Get to know me, draw closer to me, and I will reveal all these things to you. And you will be able to do what it is that I have called you to do so that you can grow in me, so that you can better serve me, so that I, you know, I can pour out all these blessings in your life. Guys, we, we get things wrong, and there's a big difference. And, and today's society, with social media, it's all about me, me, selfies all the time. I'm so handsome and gorgeous, and I'm, you know, it's all about me. And it's it shouldn't be. The last thing it should be about is me. It should always be about God. God first, and all these things will be added unto you. Okay, if you truly want to know what God's calling is for your life, and he has a plan and according for each one of us, get to know him, draw closer to him. How do we draw closer to him? Study his word. Okay, how do we draw closer to him? Pray. How do we draw closer to him? Have quiet times where you just talk to him. You know, everybody is, how do I pray? Just talk to him. Just say, Lord, you know, Today, I had a rough day. It was a bit difficult for me. So-and-so was mean to me. You know, maybe you can just show me how to, you know, deal with them better and, and to be more loving towards them. And, you know, so we don't have to get into big prayers about thou art my Lord, you know. Blah, blah. No, we overcomplicate things. Just talk to him. Read the Psalms. The Psalms are beautiful. That's how God, uh, that's how David prayed. That's how God prayed. Um, that David worshipped God and spoke to God. He was through the Psalms. He was going, Lord, I'm a wretched sinner. But in you, all things will be made right. Okay. And here we carry on in verse 20. So it says here, And he exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at the right hand, at his right hand in the heavens. Now this is where I want you to, and I'm going to just harp on this a little bit here. I want you to think about this. The same Holy Spirit, the same power that raised Christ from the dead is alive in you and me today. Okay? Now think about that as we read the next verse. Far above, okay, has seated him at his right hand, in the heavens. So that is saying Christ has been risen by the Holy Spirit that abides in you and me and is seated right now in heaven at the right hand of the Father. And it says far above every ruler and authority. So far above any um, any Satan above, you know, because Satan is called the prince of the earth, okay, or ruler of the earth. Uh, far above any king. Far above. Think of the most powerful person that you know God has risen, has raised God, um, Christ up and has seated him at the right hand, far above any one of those people. So it doesn't matter how great people think they are on earth, Christ is above all of them. Okay, so it says far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion and every title given. And the interesting thing and that title given is not a title given by God. It is a title given by man. Like the Pope who thinks he runs everything, he don't. Jesus Christ is far above him. Okay. That title of Pope was given to him by man. It means absolutely nothing. He's a man just like you and me at the end of the day. Okay. So, um, but also... Um, so let's go, everyone title given, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. 
Okay, so not only on earth is that title worthless, but in heaven for eternity, that title. When we get to heaven, and this man that so many people worship called the Pope is there, he's going to be just like you and me, maybe. We don't know. We're not sure. You know, um, I think it was Martin Luther King who said, when I get to heaven, I'll be surprised by three things. The people who I thought would be there aren't. The people who I thought won't be there are. And the fact that I'm there. Okay. Always remember that. Right. Um, so when we're talking to people, don't think that I'm a, a, a greater saint than he is. Because... You don't know what that man's life is like. When he goes home, he might spend 12 hours a day on his knees praying to God. And we don't do that. Okay. So we can never tell. But those titles mean nothing because Jesus Christ is far above every single title. Okay. And then there's another one. It says, and he subjected everything under his feet. Now, if we go back to Genesis and the fall of man, when Adam took of the fruit and uh, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and ate of it, okay, it was not Eve who forced him. Adam ate of that apple, not apple, of that fruit, sorry, freely. He chose. He didn't, he wasn't coerced or anything. He knew. He had knowledge. He said, God told me not to eat this fruit, but I'm going to eat it anyway. Okay. So a lot of people blame Eve. It wasn't Eve's fault. She was deceived. That's cool. And, but Adam chose to sin. And that is when the sin entered the world because the covenant with God and was with Adam, not with Eve. Okay. So then he said, and the one who, uh, and her son will bruise his heel on your head, talking to the serpent. So in other words, he said the foot of Jesus Christ would crush the head of Satan. And this is Again, brought up here in Ephesians 1.22, okay, where he says, and he subjected everything under his feet, okay. Um, this also refers to another verse, um, which I don't know right now, but I'll get it, okay. So, and appointed him as the head over everything for the church. So, we have heads of the church here and rulers of the church, but Christ is over the church. He is the head of the church. That's it. And it says, which is his body, the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. So I'm just going to read 22 and 23 again, because it's kind of broken up. And uh, yeah, and he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him as the head over everything for the church, which is his body. The fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. Who is the one that fills all things in every way? It is Jesus. Remember earlier I said to you, and God is delighted with everything. He said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Everything that Jesus did was accepted by God. Everything that Jesus said was accepted by God. Okay, and the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. Jesus filled all things in every way. He did everything. You remember when he was on the cross and he said, it is finished. And what he meant by it is finished was that everything you, Father, have sent me to do is now done. There is nothing else I need to do. The people that I came to save are now saved, and everything is completed. There's nothing, we started this off, there's nothing that you can do besides receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and turning away from your sins that will get you into heaven. There's no works you can do, there's no any, you can walk around feeding the poor. And this is where it comes down to, you know, and we can talk about this in our in our um, uh, defending your faith portion. Why do you know? Are good people going to go to heaven? Hmm. Well, we'll talk about that. See you now.
Cool. So we're talking about um, defending your faith. And remember I said in the beginning, there's like 20 or 24 questions that people ask. And it's the same 24 every time. So one of the questions is going to be, um, does God send good people to hell? Uh, so now we need to start <laughs> with really simple things. Um, so this is one of those questions where you can go, uh, you, you can't say what my, my normal response is. Oh, really? Where did you hear that? You know? So I suppose you could in a sense, but it doesn't make sense in the situation. So what is the simplest explanation for this? The Bible tells us that we are all born in sin. There is no one good. We can go through uh, Romans, we can go through Acts, we can go through a whole lot of books where we can find that uh, that statement, right? We are all born in sin. And the fact is that we're not sent to hell because we're good people or because we're evil or anything like it. It's just we're sent to hell because we are sinners. That's it, finished. And there is only one way that we can stop being sinners, and that is by receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and his blood will then wash us. It, the Bible tells us, will wash us whiter than snow. It washes our sins away. Okay, So when uh, Satan, the accuser, and he does this, he roams the earth and he runs around and he stands in front of God, telling him, accusing God's children of sin. So he's always, he's forever in the throne room of God, going like, look there, look there, your little servant, so and so, he's doing this, look, he did that, he sinned, he did. Because God remembers something, that even if you hide in a closet at home and you sin, you think God can, he can see you. He sees everything. He knows everything. You know, it says, um, for he knows the thoughts of our hearts and he loves us. He knows the evil intent of our hearts and he still loves us. God knows everything before we even think it. He knows what we're thinking. He knows what's in our heart. He knows what we're doing. So does he send good people to heaven? Well, what's a good person? You know? We have to really analyze that because there is no good person. The only good person is somebody who has received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and is washed by the sacrifice of the lamb that, um, uh, that God sent. The lamb of God, the ultimate lamb is Jesus. And his blood washes our sins away. Not anything we do. Okay. So I heard a good explanation now. And it says... Um, if you're sick and you don't go to the doctor and you die, is it the doctor's fault? No, it's not. Is it your fault? Yes. So if we are sinners, and we all are sinners, God doesn't exclude anybody from that. He says, for we are all born in sin. Every single person on earth from the time the first person was born into this world, he was born in sin. Done. Finished. Nobody is born perfect. Nobody is born blameless. Nobody is born um, sin-free. We are all born in sin. And the only way to get rid of that sin is to receive Jesus Christ and, and to be washed in his blood. And that's it. So we need to, when we are all ill, therefore we are all ill, and we all need to go to God the Father, the greatest physician of all, and receive healing from him. Once we've received that healing, Jesus Christ, from him, then we can enter into heaven and into eternity with him. Everybody else will, unfortunately, whether they perceived as good or morally good, they will go to hell. Unfortunately, like I said, in Christianity, there's nothing that we can do to make God receive us. Okay. Now, they always go, then, what about if you've never heard about Jesus? Hmm, well, this is a long explanation, so uh, I'll try and make it brief. Okay, it says God has given every single person a desire to worship him. We all have a God-shaped void in our heart. You can go to into uh, the most remote area, find a tribe that has never met another human being, has never been ministered to, has never met a missionary, has never met anybody else. And this tribe will be worshipping some form of God. They will either worship the sun God or something. So there is inbuilt into all of us a desire to serve God. Okay. And I was um, 
I was watching something. I love this thing because God seems to be moving amongst the Muslims at the moment. And there's, there's a big move. And there's a lot of Muslims that are waking up and they've had dreams of Jesus. I mean, I watched a testimony the other day of a man who was an alcoholic, beat his wife, but he was perceived as a good as a good, faithful man, you know, and he went to Mecca and it was at Mecca sleeping on the side of the road because there's so many people there and the hotels are awful. He was sleeping on the side of the road, in fact, in his car. And um, and um, he uh, it was the perception was that he was being holy because he was at Mecca and all that sort of stuff. And he had a dream that night. And it was Jesus calling to him, saying, serve me, serve me, serve me. And eventually he woke up the next morning and it was halfway through his, his Hajj, the, the, the pilgrimage to, to Mecca that they were supposed to do, because they go there and for so many days they wake up every day and they walk around the big rock that is in, in Mecca. And um, they pray and that sort of stuff. And he was halfway through that and he woke up that morning and he said to his friends, I must go home. And he went home and from the day he got home, he stopped drinking, he stopped beating his wife, his life changed immeasurably. Um, there was another story I heard about a, a, a man who um, smuggled Bibles into Iran. Uh, yes, Iran. Okay. And he said he used to put these. And in Iran, the Bible is known because it has a gold rim around it. And um, he was traveling through the back mountainous areas of Iran and uh, he says all of a sudden there was a fairly straight section of road his car just swerved and went into a ditch on the side of the road and he was there looking and going well I'm alone I have all these bibles in my boot if they catch me I'm going straight to jail because that's the punishment for trying to preach in Iran you go to jail and um, he said the next thing this man came running over the hill and he said you've brought the gold book you've brought the gold book and when he's spoke to the man he said to them you know how do you know about the gold book is he opened his boot and he of course gave him some bibles and he says 21 years ago i had a prayer about jesus and jesus told me that he would send somebody with the gold book can you believe it 21 years and this man had converted his entire village based on that dream he told them about jesus he told them about the amazing things and he said to them the promise is jesus said i will send somebody with the gold book and 21 years later this missionary in iran arrived there and with his car that just inexplicably swerved off the road and he distributed bibles for the in farsi bibles uh, that's the language they speak there, to this village. So God is moving in amazing ways. He has planted a desire for every single one of us to serve him. Okay. And if he wants to get that message through to people, he will through dreams, through visions, through all that sort of thing. So guys, yes, it's a bit of a harder one to deal with in terms of does God send good people to hell? Firstly, we need to define what is good. Um, and then when we come down to the standard that God lays out as what is good, none of us will ever measure up. You know, the fact is that none of us can be as good as Jesus was when he walked this earth. We all sin in some way, shape or form, no matter how holy we think we are. And if if you claim to be that faithful and 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 at that pure then you're sinning because you're lying straight away because nobody is we cannot even get close to the standard the only way that we can get close to the standard that god has set for a sinful man is or a blameless man is to receive jesus christ as lord and savior it's the only way there is no other way and it's amazing in this faith and if we look at all the other faiths in the world that god has done it all for us there's essentially nothing besides receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior that we can do that will get us into heaven. With any other faith in the world, you have to do works. You have to do this, do that, do that. No, it doesn't work. So, yes, God sadly sends uh, what we perceive as good people to hell because man, they don't measure up. And they never will measure up because they haven't been cleaned and washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. See you guys next week. I hope you have a great, great, great week. Study. Um, I don't know when the great sevens and twelves are going back to school. 
But I hope it's good. Don't be afraid. Remember that uh, our King is Jesus. He is our provider. He will lead us and guide us. He will keep us safe. He is our healer. He is our friend. He is our confidant. He is our uh, provider. He is He is everything, guys. So don't be afraid. You know what I mean? Fear is of the enemy. Don't be afraid of this COVID-19. You know, um, seriously, guys, have faith, have strength in what Jesus Christ has done for us. He's already done it for us. We can't do anything else. He's done for us. That's what we we study in us in, in, in Ephesians. Guys, have a blessed week, man. We'll see you next week. Uh, listen, and um, please, on our Facebook page, uh, we have uh, CCB Youth. Um, join us. And I'm trying to create forums where you guys can ask questions. Because I'm very used to being able to sit in front of you, read a portion of the Bible, let you ask me questions. And so this talking, it's very difficult. So please, guys, uh, post questions, um, ask things, and then I'll, I'll try and answer them every week, okay? And um, yeah, let's be a little bit more interactive. I'll talk to Pastor Dave and see if uh, we can set up a, a CCB Youth Twitter account and a CCB Youth Instagram account. And yeah, let's get you guys involved and um, let's try and, and, and create forums where you can ask questions and yeah, just let's be interactive and let's try and make things happen. Guys, have a blessed week. Okay? We'll see you next week.